Most audio experts will tell you it's impossible to have a surround sound setup that's good for movies, TV, and video games, and music. Now, while I'm a massive fan of 2.0 audio setups, and I actually think that's a better choice in many cases, I think I've found a way to approach surround sound setups that is kind of a good way to get all of those things. And audiophiles are absolutely going to hate it. Let's take a look. As usual, I have to start out with some disclaimers. First, no one's paying me to make this video and it's not sponsored in any way. Anything that I like or dislike in this video are my own opinions based on the facts that I'll show you. Also, and I think most importantly, anybody could put together a better sounding surround sound system than I'm showing you here, as long as you're willing to drop a ton of cash. Because that's really what I'm most proud of, what I was able to do on the budget that I have. And I'll be repeating the phrase for the money all the time in this and every other video that's audio based that I put out because that's really the key. And that's honestly the point of this video, trying to teach you some tips that may or may not help you get the best out of your own surround sound system for the money that you've already spent. If you'd like some videos on how to spend a gazillion dollars on the best sounding stuff ever made, I'll definitely link to some very awesome channels, but I'm just here trying to talk to my fellow nerds and show you what I did with my setup because maybe it'll help you with yours. All right, let's get started. Here's a quick rundown. I have an NAD T758 V3i as the heart of this setup for one very specific reason. I loved NAD's two-channel IC316B amp for music and wanted that exact same sound for my main setup. This amp has an analog bypass setting that makes two-channel analog audio sound like a slightly better version of their C3B amp, but when driving all nine speakers for surround, I'm still totally happy with the sound that comes out in that mode. Unfortunately, you need some cheap accessories for the HDMI ports to work right, but don't worry, I have a workaround I'll show later. For the front speakers, I'm using Ascend Acoustics. I discovered them when looking for magnetically shielded speakers that are safe to use near my CRT wall and absolutely fell in love with them. When I set this amp to analog bypass mode, these are the only speakers active, and I don't think I've ever heard a two-channel setup at this price point that I've liked as much. And in fact, I liked it so much that that was basically the catalyst for this and a few other videos I'll be making focused on audio. And that's also what got me to the point that I could confidently tell you, if you love listening to music or love playing classic video games with two channel audio, start with the best two front speakers that your budget will allow. Then when it comes to amp, you could certainly start out with something free or cheap that you find at a thrift store, but when it's time to spend some money, either get yourself a good two channel amp or choose an amp that's surround sound, but with music focused features. After experimenting with quite a few different AVRs, I really found that when I set this one to analog bypass mode, that it's one of the best two channel music experiences I've ever had. Now, once again, to be crystal clear about this, by no means am I telling you to buy the equipment I've purchased. I'm just trying to push the theory that I've really discovered recently of music first. Start by building a two channel setup that provides you the best experience you could afford at the time, and then worry about your other speakers afterwards. If need be, pick up any cheap speakers for the surround, and then upgrade as budget allows, which is exactly what I hope to someday do here. I would love Ascend Acoustics more expensive models for the fronts, and then move my current fronts to the back, because it's my opinion that I'd rather spend my money where I'm going to use the stereo most, the front speakers. Because while not only is music very important to me, you have to remember that most of the sound in a surround sound setup comes from the front speakers with mostly effects coming out of the rest. Now, of course, you should still take your surround seriously, and one of the best ways to approach this is by running your amp's calibration software. At the very least, it'll make sure that the volume levels match for all of them based on where you sit in the room, but some software even helps with frequency calibration. Now, of course, in a perfect world, it would be best to have 
every single speaker be the exact same one so that all of the sound surrounding you matches, but that's just not realistic. As long as you spend the time to get decent speakers, because remember, you're never going to make terrible speakers miraculously sound good, but get decent speakers for surround, upgrade as budget allows, and make sure they're properly placed and calibrated, you should still have a great experience, even if you're sticking with the whole music first front speaker and amp mentality. But anyway, I just wanted to take a moment to explain where my mindset was and to make sure that the flow of this video stays on track. But let's get back to the setup and show the rest of the speakers. I'm also using a Send Acoustic for the center channel speaker as it's also magnetically shielded and about the same type of sound as the bookshelf ones, so they kind of match. I added some rubber risers to make sure the speakers are pointed at my head, and that seemed to do the trick. If you have any other ideas on how to angle this, please let me know, but the shelves need to stay where they are to support the CRTs. Up top, I have two Polk speakers that I bought, both because they were nearly half off for Prime Day and because of their convenient ceiling mounts that they shipped with. Also, a friend who's a real audiophile said he thought they were amazing for the price and even uses them himself as outdoor speakers. These are powered by the back channels of the amp, and while they're not magnetically shielded, they don't interfere with the monitors at all, yes, of course I double checked, since they're both far enough away and have the magnetic field of the speakers pointed up towards the ceiling, not towards the monitors. The surround sound speakers are two ELACs I've had for a while that used to be my main speakers, and I always thought they sounded really good, especially when connected to a decent amp. If I'm lucky, someday I'll get those more expensive Ascend Acoustics for the fronts, put the front ones back here to replace these, and probably gift these to a friend. But hey, no clue when that's actually going to happen. I have the subwoofer in the rear corner, which is another thing that'll piss off a lot of audiophiles. I really had no choice though, as the subwoofer, as well as the two surround speakers, are not magnetically shielded, so they needed to be on the opposite side of the room of the CRTs. Now, I'm just going to pause really quick and say that if you've stumbled across this video on YouTube and have no idea why I keep obsessing over old display technology, I'll just very quickly sum it up as this. If you play old video game consoles that didn't come natively with an HDMI output, CRTs are the best way to experience those games with no latency and no motion blur. And they're also a really excellent way to show old TV shows and old movies with a lot of interference or film grain. If you're interested in that stuff, please check out the channel, hit subscribe, the bell, whatever you're supposed to say these days if you're a YouTuber. But anyway, back to the video. I got pretty creative with the back speakers, and I'm really proud of what I did with this, which means audiophiles will probably hate this the most, but I needed some good studio monitors to mix my music and videos, but I also wanted them magnetically shielded in case I ever needed to move my desk closer to the CRT wall. They turned out to be amazing, and the flat output is the perfect contrast to the exciting output of the Ascend Acoustic speakers. Before I got those studio monitors, I was genuinely worried that they might take away from my full audio setup, because what if I just got lazy, decided to listen to music through those, and not use the main setup as much? But really, the opposite happened. The flat output of these makes it really great for mixing, and when you listen to music through them, you do definitely get a different kind of sound that you could kind of analyze the audio a bit better, but whenever I'm just listening to music, I always end up going through the main setup. Now, that said, when connected as back speakers in the surround setup, the flat mix doesn't really matter because mostly you're just having effects come out of these, and having some really good quality speakers added to the rest of the setup was a massive benefit. Also, I used to unplug and replug them every time I wanted to switch over, but thanks to my friends in the MD4EA Discord, shout out to B and Artemio and T here, I was able to find a cool different switch box setup. The reason I chose this specific switch box and setup is because I wanted to run the balanced audio outputs out of this md 4 a approved Motu M4 into the balanced XLR inputs of the studio monitors. However, these do not allow to have both things connected at once. You're only allowed to have one source connected at a time. So I ran that all through this switch box and then just took the RCA line level outputs from the back speakers of the amp ran those through a converter, and ran that through as well. The only downsides of this are, number one, I had to turn up the studio monitors a lot more because the audio dropped when running unbalanced through balanced, and also the NAD amp had a weird ground loop issue that none of the other amps I've had in this setup ever had, 
So I had to use a ground isolator for this, which was very cheap. I'll leave a link to the one Artemio suggested that I'm using here. And that's totally solved the ground issue. So now my setup is as simple as switch the switch box over to setting A whenever I want to just use it with my PC, and then switch it to B whenever I want to listen to it connected to the surround sound system. And I'll probably get some more RCA to XLR adapters and use that as C if I ever just want to pump in an extra audio source to these. So that's the basic overview of the speaker setup. This next section is going to be focused on the amp that I'm using. But once again, I am not saying that this is the equipment to buy. If you do own this amp though, I think I have a couple of fixes and workarounds that would be a huge help to you, so definitely watch the rest of it. If you don't have this amp, maybe you'd still want to watch just for the theories behind it, or maybe I would spark an idea. But also, what other amps do you all know about that would function similarly? Are there any other decent quality AVRs in the same price point that would perform the same way in that you could have an analog bypass mode? You could have all of the power of the amp directed to just the two front speakers when you're in just 2.0 mode. I'm gonna be reading the comments and I would love to hear whatever you all have to say about this and other suggestions that you have. Just keep it in the same price point that you would expect. Now, as far as this amp goes, I'm going to start out with the number one issue I had with it, the HDMI ports. Their HDMI ports are basically just switchable pass-throughs with no active circuitry in it, which is actually a good thing if you're a gamer because that means there's zero chance of latency being added to it. Now, of course, I tested this and I verified with a time sleuth that there is zero milliseconds of latency added when you're running your games through this thing. But there is one downside of that. That means because there's no active circuitry in it, you need to add up your total HDMI cable length and it's got to be pretty short without another device connected. I'll get back to that in a second, but basically, if you have a five foot cable connecting your streaming box or your Blu-ray player to this device, and then you have a 10 foot cable running from this device to your projector, your TV, whatever else, you need to count that as a 15 foot cable. It's essentially like a coupler in the middle of it. So I ran into a ton of issues with that. And I tried everything. I emailed NAD back and forth for months who were pretty awful to me. Gotta say, thanks for that NAD. But they never once mentioned that about the pass-through circuitry, which is weird because it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing as long as you know that that's the case. So the very, very simple fix is just put some kind of powered HDMI device on the output if you're using longer cables, like if you have a projector set up. I used one of these splitters, which was part of the recent video that I had just posted talking about different HDMI devices, and there were a few things that I thought really benefited. First, I ran the power from this splitter to my UPS, my uninterrupted power supply, and have it always powered on 24-7, whereas the whole rest of my setup runs through different power strips that are only on when I'm using them. But by leaving this on 24-7, it really doesn't matter which device powers up first, because this is always going to be there to present the correct EDID. And that is the other couple of advantages of this one. This has EDID spoofing built in, so you could tell it that I have a 4K60-444 Dolby Atmos surround sound system connected, so that all of the source devices read it properly. And it also has things like active downscaling if you want to. Now, if you're just somebody who's watching TV and movies, that's a useless feature that you won't need at all. But if you're a streamer who wants to game in 4K, but stream in 1080p, this is awesome because you could still run everything through your normal setup and then just take the secondary output of this into your capture card, flicking the switch on it and setting it to 1080p. You could also use this for any other kind of issues like PS3 compatibility or any times that you'd want a device like this used. So overall, this was a bonus. And while I don't think it's a problem with the NAD amp, I think it's a serious problem that it took them six months to communicate that to me. The only other issue I had with the amp was the weird ground loop thing, which two other amps that I tested with those powered rear speakers did not have the ground loop. Now, of course, that probably means there's issues with the wiring in my house, but that also means the other amps probably had some kind of ground loop protection built in, whereas this one does not. So once again, that's on me, not on NAD. However, I do really think that a less than $20 filter device was a great fix for it, and I'm totally happy with that solution. 
So other than the workarounds, now let's just go through and I'm just gonna feed the output to my capture card and let's just check out, not all, but a quick rundown of some of the features that it has. All right, so let's just walk through the menu options and I'll give some tips that I figured out as I went. First are the DSP options, the di digital signal processing, and the listening mode is what you're really gonna wanna worry about for different sources. You have a whole bunch of different ones, including analog bypass, which is what I almost always use when listening to cassette, vinyl records, old video game consoles, or anything that I really feel like. I don't want any filtering. I want that raw original analog sound. I think this is what really makes this stand out from different amps that I've tried over the years. But tell me your thoughts below. Maybe I'm kind of missing something here. Of course, there's just standard stereo mode, which is still a two channel mode, but with the digital signal processing. There is enhanced stereo, which is basically the same thing, but then you could also choose which other speakers you want active. I'll show that in a second. Uh, and then there's other modes that you're going to want to go through and read the manual and see how they apply to you, or basically just listen as, as you go and kind of go from there. Now, using Dolby Surround or things like the Neural X might be imperative when you're using older surround formats like Dolby Pro Logic, but I will have a completely separate video on that soon. So not trying to get you <laughs> to watch more than one video. I'm just trying to be respectful of people's time in case you don't care about that stuff. So stay tuned for that one. But I'm going to leave this set to analog bypass as always for my analog inputs and kind of move on. Tone controls is something that I also like to do. I turn on tone defeat, which basically disables all of the tone controls because I want to rely on the source and anything else that is not changing the signal. I basically want to keep this as true to the original as possible. Once again, let me know if you think I'm wrong for doing it, but that's certainly how, at least today, at the time of recording, I prefer to listen. Going back, zone controls are basically if you just want multiple zones, which I don't have here. Uh, going through the setup menu, there's a bunch of stuff here, and as you've probably already noticed, there really isn't a good flow to this menu. I'm not really sure why they set it up like this, and also, it doesn't at all match what the cell phone app version is, which is kind of dumb in my opinion. They should both be identical, so whatever. But source setups are basically, uh, all you need to do is select which analog or video input matches the source name, this is all well done. You could change anything you want around it. I think this is a really good setup for this. I think NAD did a good job. Um, and I also like how you could have different analog gain settings. So if you have one component that's much quieter or much louder, you could adjust that right here. Uh, same with the digital stuff and everything else. Speaker setup. Uh, this is where you would set which speaker is which. And this is also a setting for enhanced bass, which depending on your setup, you may or may not like this one. Um, if you have a subwoofer and you want to add more bass, turn it on. I usually leave it on, but there have been some cases where I went in and made sure to turn it off. Also, if you're using Dolby Atmos speakers, make sure to set where they are here and the size of them as well. Speaker levels are things that you don't need to worry about if you have the Dirac Live room calibration on. Not sure why that was just off. That should have been on this entire time, uh, which is yet another reason why I wish the cell phone app matched this. But I'll get back at the end to showing how to do that room correction. I'll just show a very quick overview of it. There's already many other videos out there that, that show it. Uh, and speaker distance also is you know exactly what you would expect. If you use the room calibration software, you don't need to worry about that. The only other cool trick is if you turn off the calibration and then you uh, hit the test button on your remote control, you could go through and have a test pattern play whenever it is that you want to test your speakers. And I find this really handy because often the RCA connectors that I use to connect the rear speakers kind of get loose sometimes. So before I go to watch a movie in Dolby Atmos mode, I'll go through each one to make sure all the wires are connected. Here is the other really important part that took me a minute to figure out. The back speakers, um, the so not surround, but back can be selected here. And the way I have it set up is to go into the Dolby Atmos height speakers, the height ones. You need to do this in order to tell the amp which speakers are being amplified by the amp itself 
and which speakers you're using the RCA outputs. The way this one worked, I have the RCA outputs run from the side of the amp, as you can see here. I'll have arrows pointing to where I plugged it in. And I have that run all the way around the room through the wall so you don't really trip over it in certain places back to those powered speakers that I showed. And then I have the height speakers powered through the back parts of the amp. So hopefully everything on screen makes sense to you now, but let's just keep going through. And that's definitely something that uh, wasn't so clear to me in the manual. Trigger setup is if you want it to power on with other components. Listening modes are different profiles that you can select that I don't like at all. I really wish there was just an app that made it easy to switch. But as I showed before, you could just press the button right on the amp in order to change the listening mode, even if you don't have your display powered on. Uh, these are all just the basic Dolby Digital and other enhanced setups. An enhanced stereo is the other thing that I just wanted to show here. This tells you what speakers are on whenever you have the enhanced stereo on. So for this one, um, I have the subwoofer turned on as I showed in the other menu, but if you wanted, you could also have any of these others playing when you're in enhanced stereo mode. For me personally, I use enhanced stereo whenever I just want extra bass. So that's why I have it set this way. For me, enhanced stereo is essentially bass boost because it turns on the subwoofer, but you could do it however you would like. Uh, other than that, there's just basic front panel display setup, and I like how you can choose what is being displayed. You might want to consider these two because I always like to have the audio codec shown so that I know exactly what format is playing. And that's how I knew that I needed to do a factory reset on the amp a few times. So when I was playing something that I knew was Dolby Atmos and it showed PCM stereo or vice versa, I knew the amp was getting a little wonky, so I did the factory reset. So that one's important. And of course, it's really nice to know what source is going through. So that's always one that you want to put on. Um, AV presets are something that you could work on if you would like as well. I didn't set those up either. And uh, then there's just very basic system and upgrade stuff that you could do as well. Now, I mentioned the room correction before, and I just wanted to give a few tips for that if you're using the direct live room correction on this or on any other amp. But I first plugged the microphone that it came with directly into the front microphone port of the amp, and I couldn't get a proper reading. So then I used the converters and the dongles that it came with, plugged it into the USB port, and then everything worked perfect. So definitely do it that way on this and probably other amps, unless the manual tells you otherwise. But the process was easy and super boring. You just hook up the microphone to a mic stand, you place it in many different positions around the room, you let it play its weird test pattern so that the microphone reads what the speakers are outputting. And then that's basically it. Just make sure to back up and save the file because there were a few times that this amp crashed on me and I needed to do a factory reset. Still don't understand why that happened. However, the factory reset took like a minute. Restoring this calibration file also only took about a minute, which is a big relief because it's boring and takes a long time to run that calibration. But the fact that I was able to set this back up right the way it was, it is a very cool thing. So I didn't really care that it crashed. It was only twice in over six months, but I've never had an amp do that before. So that was kind of weird. The only thing that would be cool is if NAD did a full backup and restore. So you could have all of the ports that you labeled saved as well. But overall, not really that big a deal. So I hope this video was able to give you some tips and maybe some perspective on building your own setup, especially my whole opinion of music first, because I've seen so many times in the past people try to make surround sound setups sound good for music, but I really do think what I've been experimenting with of starting with a setup that's great for music and then sort of adapting that to eventually get to a Dolby Atmos setup was really the right move, at least for me. If you're somebody that only watches TV and movies, most of what I said here was probably just a waste of your time, but hey, at least maybe you're mildly entertained by all of it. Also, I realize this NAD amp is very expensive and probably out of the budget of many people, but if that's the case, just start with two really good bookshelf speakers and kind of move on. 
For me personally, I spent my whole childhood with Cousin Scott twisting together wires and soldering stuff together to make our fake 4.0 surround sound systems because that's the only option we had. And basically, that's how I've approached audio my whole life. Let me figure out whatever it is I could afford at the moment and see how I could tinker with that and place the speakers differently and tweak it to make it sound as best as possible. And I really think that's kind of the other point of this video is it's not about getting the best audio because that's almost impossible. You could drop millions of dollars and maybe not even achieve that. It's getting the best for the amount of money that you're spending. And that I think is probably the most important tip I could ever give anybody dipping their toes into the audio world. It's about best for your setup, best for your wallet, and really what you would enjoy and appreciate. So for me personally, saving up my money for quite a long time to be able to get a setup like this is something that's very important to me. And especially having the ability to put on a vinyl record, listen to music, and then just push a few buttons and have that same setup be a very reasonable Dolby Atmos surround sound system that I'm very happy with. I think that's something that I've really wanted my whole life, and I'm very glad that I'm here to, at this point. But that's it for this time. I will have a couple more audio videos coming in the future, including one on just 2.0 audio, because if you don't care about surround sound, you could save yourself a lot of money. But there's a few other videos probably coming before that, and of course, all of the weekly stuff that I usually work on. And if you are a fan of the channel, please consider subscribing. The monthly support services are also what keep all of this going, including just doing things like clicking on affiliate links, as well as buying the same stuff that you would have bought anyway from eBay and Amazon at the same price, but clicking through our affiliate links so that we get a small cut. That's what keeps all of this stuff going. So thank you to everybody who supports and I'll see you next time.